Maria, please, the floor is yours. Hello, hello everyone. I'm very happy to be here with you. Um, yeah, uh, Toby, thanks for your presentation. Um, so Toby was and is a writer turned um, attorney, although he continues his writing practice. Uh, and I'm probably a lawyer turned art creator, although occasionally I do consult on some legal issues. Um, and today I probably wanted to share with you some tips or as I call them, uh, do's and don'ts, like really practical tips on uh, contracts um, for our professionals, because unfortunately um, our professionals do not always um, uh, know how to draft contracts and our contract is actually probably something that you really want to have. And I met many artists and generally creat creatives who um, didn't have contracts or prefer not to even deal with contracts, not try them, read them, or even sign them without, um, without treating. So I'll share my presentation. It's a small one, really. Um, give me a second. Um, yeah. Is it? Okay. Um, I hope you can see the presentation here. Um, so our, I'm really going to cover our really practical things here. And the first case that we actually discussed, the first um, issue is uh, local well, free legal help initiatives or pro bono. Um, of course, lawyers are, it's, it's better if you can, and if you are, um, can afford that, it's better to hire a lawyer who would walk on your case, uh, even from the beginning, from the negotiation stage. And I would advise to do that if you have a big agreement or a set of agreements and the amount of money is huge, then probably you should, you'd better hire a lawyer. If you cannot afford that, um, there are many initiatives around the globe or I'm, I'm not, I haven't put any particular here, but sometimes, I, but I think th these were mentioned by Toby and colleagues, um, uh, but they also are, they can be, um, well, let's see, uh, grad law students or law firms that have pro bono uh, services, or for instance, you can consult local art uh, labor unions that exist in some countries. They may be official or unofficial, but they do provide legal services or well, some sort, and usually they are pro bono. Uh, the second point here is it's, it's so evident, but I heard that some people are from the creative field are really intimidated um, and even bullied into sign uh, into signing contracts. Uh, I haven't heard myself, but I heard stories from friends of friends that that happened. Unfortunately, well, if you if you're not a lawyer, you should not be intimidated to um, to deal with legal documents really, and if you negotiate them by yourself. Um, even if you're, you don't have legal support, right? Um, so uh, you should vocal, vocalize and be vocal about everything that you don't like. And try to amend uh, the provisions of the contracts uh, that you think are wrong. And I think that's uh, a completely uh, fair thing. So don't be intimidated, no matter how big an institution that is dealing with you. Well, the third point, um, it's not, uh, it seems that it's not legal, but it's one of the most important ones. Um, don't agree to work for free. And on the right, you can see this. These are actually, I think, um, are the stickers from the Hong Kong Association, or Artist, Artist Union, Hong Kong Artist Union. I've been to their workshop um, and they're doing a lot, although they are like four years old. Um, and are, so there, there are many artist unions all around the globe, but many artists are also uh, starting to claim that or, you know, they want work for free. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense because um, if, let's say, you're a recent grad um, in design, for instance, and you're approached by a big, by a big firm and they say, well, um, you can work for free for us and you will add uh, the work is, that you do for us to uh, your portfolio and you will agree to that. Uh, well, your portfolio will be growing, but your wallet will be still empty and you need money to uh, it and to sleep somewhere. And actually, it's not your only your personal thing. Um, I think that uh, it also influences the whole industry, locally and internationally. Creatives, I think, are paid lesser than other professionals. And uh, because, well, companies say, and big institutions say that, um, well, if you're a creative person, you probably enjoy what you're doing, so you should work for free. And then creatives start uh, looking for different jobs and they do their creative stuff at night but at night they're supposed to um, sleep. 
So, you know, our, this, is, this is very important. So I advise you to be advocates and not work for free. When you're volunteering, that's fine. When you help your friends, I think that's also fair. There are also are times when you exchange services for services or goods for goods. That's okay as well, if that works for you. But um, again, that's not a contract that I'm talking about. Work should be done um, and should be paid for. Um, point four is just different types of contracts that you might encounter. I think you've encountered all of them. Um, I'd say that employment contracts are rare. Uh, well, they're not that are um, when you when you are do are short term when you're involved in short term projects, they're not that um, often um, done because employees are better protected. Are uh, they paid uh, twice or once a month? and your employer has to pay more taxes and some while well, some money goes to pension funds or health insurance so employers prefer not to enter into employment agreements well services that's just a common thing uh commission is when you're doing a new work license um i think toby talked about a lot about ip rights so license is about that consignment and sale and purchase that's um more often are, well, it's for galleries and people selling and buying art. And loan agreements is probably used more often when you are loaning your work, when you're participating in an exhibition, for instance. But there are things to my, well, that, that's just my personal view, uh, number five, things that you should not forget to include in any contract, really. If you are drafting, especially if you're drafting it yourself as an artist, as an art professional. So the term, um, so how, how it means how long the agreement will be, um, you, you will be performing under that agreement. And is there an opportunity to renew it? Our payment is very important, as I've mentioned, and you should think about what has to be done for you to receive the payment and what happens if our, you don't receive it on time. And termination, I'd say that this should be reciprocal. So if one of the parties has the right to terminate the agreement, um, like given two uh, weeks notice, then you should have this right as well. Uh, point six, um, well, this is very important. I've heard it so many times from different friend artists, uh, designers or, and curators as well. Uh, if you are contracted, if, you're, uh, if you want, well, you should, you should have a contract, of course, but you should include advanced payment in it. It can be 30%, 40, 50. I saw our advanced payments of 70, even 100%. That happens as well. Um, but you should sign a contract, get an advanced payment, and then start working. With our payment in installments, it's probably a good example would be when you are, let's say you're writing a book or a new publishing house is waiting for it. So you give them chapter one, you give the first payment or the first installment, then chapter two, you receive the second one and here it goes. You don't have to wait um, well the whole year to get the whole amount. And uh, then you should discuss the uh, net amount. That's also very important because our, um, you should tell them, let's say, I want a million for the work that I do. And it does not include any taxes, any other, I don't know, um, amounts that I'll have to pay to the bank for bank transfers. So this is the net amount that I should get. And, and it is important And people sometimes try to calculate taxes uh, beforehand and it, it doesn't work really. Um, and point seven, I've also heard this many times from artists uh, and designers again, um, because uh, if you have a client, for instance, they want to, uh, today they like these colors, tomorrow they like that color, um, and they all ask you to make amendments and alterations to your projects quite often. I think it happens less with artists who work for themselves or with curators, but it quite often happens with designers. So you should discuss beforehand how many alterations you're gonna have, how many times you have to amend your product, your work, because otherwise you'll be working for free again, altering it uh, for weeks for free. And uh, number eight was discussed by Toby, that's IP rights. I would say that's important for work for hire contracts. And I think in many jurisdictions, employment agreements are work for hire. That means that uh, when you work for your employer, if you have an employment agreement or work for hire a contract, that means that whatever property that you produce, intellectual property, most likely will belong to the employer. And then if you want it, um, if you were working on your own project and you want to set a line between your own project and the projects of your employer, and they're quite similar, um, then you should probably work on your own laptop 
uh, don't work from the premises of your employer. Don't use uh, their software and not don't work during working hours. But still, there are many cases, I think, in our tech industry, in our um, in startups, where it's really hard to set this line. And sometimes um, some engineers or designers who want to start their own businesses have to buy their IP rights, IP, their intellectual property from their ex uh, employers, which is, which is sad actually. And uh, last but not least is a limitation of liability. That means that I know creatives, I know myself, um, are sometimes late with deadlines. So probably your agreement will include this provision as well. Um, uh, but first of all, try to not include it. Uh, but probably the other party who is contracting you will try to impose this on you. And they are, it, it's fair because uh, if they don't pay you on time, uh, you'll ask additional compensation from them. So if you don't deliver on time, if you are not uh, really following your deadlines, uh, they'll try to get fine inside of the contract. So try to minimize it. Um, and just a couple of more things are, well, finally, when you have that agreement uh, done, when you get a template from the other party, read it, amend it, don't be afraid, uh, don't be afraid of legalese. And I'm talking about situations when you have to deal with the agreement. Um, and finally, sign the contract. And never ever please sign anything before you read it. I mean, that's just really important. Um, I mentioned here this website, Docracy. Um, it's one of the websites there, I think it's US or um, for US contracts. But I think there are many others where you can uh, have templates. So if uh, somehow it's your party, it's you who have to create a template to start the contract, uh, there are many options online. Again, it's better to ask an attorney than try to find someone uh, from legal organization pro bono if you cannot afford it. But there are options as well if you're just completely left without any help. There are templates online. And then when you'll be performing the contract, don't forget about deadlines, of course, uh, and be prepared, as Toby mentioned, if something goes wrong, you'll have to go to court probably and defend your rights. But first of all, um, if you will be contacting the other party and asking what's happening, why are you not paying me or when the deadline is, is already here or it has passed, uh, try to keep the correspondence in writing. That's another mistake that sometimes people do. Uh, you can call them once, but better than, or just keep it in, the, keep it in writing. Chain of emails is fine. And our last but not least, um, what if you do an international project? Because I work with um, international projects a lot. Um, so I think that an a, co a contract, um, if you're dealing internationally, will not be that different from a contract uh, that you will have uh, domestically or uh, locally. Uh, probably you will have it in different languages. Are on the, and one of the languages will be the prevailing language, meaning that you should have um, your agreement or, well, basically negotiated in one language, but then have a translation. And just an, as an example on the right, I give uh, two wordings for this, how to write or which language is the prevailing one. And of course, you should proofread the contract and proofread the translation. This is well where you probably are, will have to spend some money if, if that's the situation on a translator or uh, if uh, during the negotiations with the other party, you can ask them to pay the translator and do the translation themselves. That's a nice idea. For instance, if you are a writer or if you're an artist and you're invited to participate in a conference or an exhibition, while the other party should have funds to uh, probably help you with the translation because they're bigger of an institution and probably they'll do the translation themselves. And law and courts, it's a huge, huge um, issue. Uh, it's impossible to discuss it like in, in a couple of minutes, but basically uh, the law that, of the contract and the courts uh, that you choose should have some relevance to uh, the place um, and to the parties and or to the parties. Um, but sometimes it's a matter of negotiations. So usually, in my experience, the stronger party in negotiations uh, tries to get the law that it wants and the courts that it likes. And usually, uh, these are the courts that are closer to it. So if I'm in, in Moscow, probably I'll try to put Moscow courts, Russian courts at least, in there. And if you are in Nigeria, that might be a problem. So again, our, you should try to explain to the other party that you, if something happens, you don't want to travel to Moscow to, uh, you know, to participate in hearings, in court hearings. 
And these three things are also, I think, important. Uh, you not necessarily you will see them in our local contracts, but in international art contracts, you might see them. Our payment, as I mentioned, again, very important to be paid. Uh, but it's important to know in which currency you're paid. And if you're not paid in the currency that you want to, there'll be a conversion rate uh, mentioned. And you should either fix it in the agreement or um, track it to the conversion rate of the central bank. So just think about currency and which currency you'll be paid. And also a very important thing, and I had some problems with some artists with this, if there are sanctions or some restrictions are on currency transfers, you should check uh, with your bank whether you can get a, a transfer, a money transfer from our banks of a certain country. That's very important because otherwise you'll have to, if this doesn't work, if uh, your bank uh, doesn't accept these transfers, you'll have to open uh, a new account in a different bank or you'll have to consider some other options. I don't know whether Western Union may, may work in this um, case or things like that, but you'll, be, you'll try and the other party will try to, to be creative with this. Customs, transportation and insurance. Um, well, this is uh, important maybe if you are um, a curator, an artist or a collector, not for writers so much, for designers. Um, some countries don't have art insurance. So if you're doing an exhibition in this country or you're transporting a work to this country um, that doesn't have art insurance uh, like at all, they might have some property insurance, but not art insurance. I think what you are doing and how to, um, well, what to do with this situation. Um, then uh, if you're traveling, well, it's not that easy uh, to travel with an artwork in your case, especially if it looks like a painting, because most likely you would be stopped at the customs and you will have to explain to the customs officer what you are doing and you'll have to file a, a form at the customs and probably uh, pay, um, pay some money. Um, and sometimes, or, so, and also you might need to show or not expertise, uh, some paperwork that you were supposed to be, that was supposed to be done uh, prior to, you know, traveling. So um, if you're a contemporary artist, um, traveling with your work, or, and it looks like or something, something of a painting or a sculpture, be aware of that. And also, or sometimes you are, can enter a country with, uh, let's say, a Picasso, are, but you cannot get out of the country with this painting. So you can get out of the country, but uh, Picasso will stay there. Uh, just because there's uh, some countries have, or um, they protect uh, their heritage, uh, well, protect um, art and um, important artworks uh, and uh, heritage of that country. So you just won't be able to get out of the country um, with this artwork, unless you are um, explicitly stating beforehand that it's just a temporarily um, well, import and export for exhibition, for instance. Um, here I should uh, make a point that our, uh, well, lawyers generally charge you, unless it's pro bono. If, but if you're not sure about customs, transportation, and insurance, uh, the thing is you can always call, call these companies, which do transportation, and usually these, the same companies do customs, and insurance companies, and ask them for advice. Because you won't be able to transport it's quite often you won't be able to deal without them. They will be a, they will be eager to give you all the details about these things. So you will learn a lot more um, about these things just calling them and asking them. And even you can tell them about your exact situation that will help you even before you hire them. And finally, our um, taxes. Um, so uh, if you are dealing internationally, um, don't forget that tax rates matter uh, matter and they're different. And there are double tax treaties somewhere, but somewhere uh, there aren't any uh, between some countries. It, uh, this happens. So it means that you have to pay taxes twice, um, which is a bad thing, probably. And um, you can also structure your contract if you are, again, dealing internationally so that you don't have to, as an artist, for instance, you don't have to file uh, tax forms. I think it happened to me once when I was dealing with a very famous, um, very good, actually, video artist. And he refused to participate in the exhibition because uh, some months before, he also worked with a company from a country, let's say a country X, and uh, they made him file the tax forms. And he lives in the jungle, so uh, really far away from uh, any city. So he had to travel. He had to travel to the city center, to uh, the capital, I think, and then file the papers and then queue for hours um, in the tax center. So he was, uh, he didn't want to participate. <laughs> we tried to uh, tell them him to 
would try to tell him that he, he, we will do everything for him. He won't have to repeat this thing, but he refused. So be aware of that. Wow, I, I think I'm done actually. <laughs> that was a marathon. Um, I'm sorry, I tried to include everything um, in this short uh, presentation. Um, but I think the presentation um, will stay or, and you'll be able to return to it. I think the main points are there. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, that's it. If you have any questions, I think you can, you can ask, ask me. Yep, thank you very much, Maria. Um, so we have um, one question um, from Adaku. Um, so what she asked, so what she stated is, is working for free considered only in terms of monetarily benefits? Um, can benefits be weighed against monetary gains? Um, yeah, I, th I think that I mentioned in a way that or I consider it services for services or goods for goods. And I think it's, it's a personal and ethical question. Um, if you are, well, again, it's, it's up, every situation is very particular and you should consider whether, um, you feel like you are really not being paid for the work you, you're providing or you are, um, investing your time and money, but you're getting something back and you feel that you are doing the right thing. Um, yeah, that, that would be the explanation. Oh, thank you very much. And does anybody else have any questions that are on regarding uh, Maria's presentation? Um, as with Toby's presentation, you can always drop um, us an email. Ooh.